Hey everybody, Free Me TV, Free Me Podcast. Thank you for tuning back in. Um, today I got a special, special interview with two guests that choose to remain anonymous. They choose to remain anonymous because they're two females and their loved ones are locked up in a particular prison. We'll discuss all of these details in fashion, but um, and they want to bring forth of corruption that they know is going on inside of this particular prison. So we're going to get into a lot of corruption and um, some particular officers that is creating this this havoc and retaliation against inmates. So stay tuned. Make sure to hit the like, the subscribe. This is the only channel that's going to bring you the real, real, not the real fake. Free me TV, man. Control, this is Agent Algren. I need to request to open up cell 311. Free Me Podcast. Okay. Before we get started, ladies, I do want to say this, right? I love having ladies on the show that come on to speak about, you know, their loved ones that are incarcerated and and just the things that they face. Um, I want to 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 just give you guys shouts out, all of the women out there that are holding the men down for wrongful convictions, you know, innocent men in prison, and even those that are not and just sticking by their man, you know, you guys are heroes. People really don't understand because of the way that they look at us. You know, we, we're disrespected and right. we're just looked upon like it's nothing. But I, I want you ladies, because right. anytime I get some women on here, I want you guys just to share a little bit of what it takes to run a single family home and keep your man supported through everything that he's going on. What you guys have to go through just on a daily basis, just start shooting some things out there of just just things that you guys do, man, to hold this stuff down. Um, for starters, have two I mean, jobs. That the the constant anxiety, the constant stress, making sure that they have what they need in there. Um, it's an ongoing thing. It's never a break. It's it's always something. Uh, we also have to keep their mental up to par so that they don't lose focus or get caught up in the nonsense that goes behind those walls. And what about just like the daily it's, life of just, just getting the kids to school on time, making sure their education is proper. And, 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 and like yes. you guys said, work two jobs and make sure that, again, you still have because one parent's already out of the house and you don't want the yes. other parent to be out of the house. But you have to work two jobs, but you still have to maintain some sort of balance there. Plus, make time to get the child to visitation. And then everything yes. that you have to go through, if somebody can give me a little detail on just what you have to go through from your side of going to visit somebody in prison. I mean, the drive up there, the financial stress of it. I mean, we're taking care of the kids and then we have to make sure we have the money to have that gas to get to visit. Make sure our car maintenance is, is up to date so that way we're not breaking down on the way to visit. And, you know, um, the food, once you get into that visiting room, you know, the, the mental stress of our kids not wanting to leave their dad once we're walking out of that visiting room, you know what I mean? Um, us waking yes. up alone every day, every night, you know what I mean? We A lot of people misinterpret women who marry men incarcerated that we can't find a man on the street and that's not the case. You can't help who you fall in love with or where their location is at that moment. I mean, there's men on the street that can treat you way worse than a man that's incarcerated that's behind those walls. So the the misinterpretation of why can't she just find somebody outside? Well, you know, sometimes that person outside isn't better for you. I mean, and that misinterpret. I, I wish people would stop assuming that about us because that's not the case. Your heart mm -hmm. wants, wants it, what it is. But it, it's not easy. It, by no means is this a situation that any woman can handle because some people get into the situation, it's going to be easy. And it's not. This is something that you have to be a strong, independent mm. woman to be able to do, especially when you get with the individual who has an indeterminate sentence or a long sentence. Yep. It, it's not easy. Even to that. 
Amen. It's not Amen. Easy. It's far from easy. And, and I'm, and I'm so, I mean, I, I, I couldn't have articulated it any better. I mean, that's, that's it. And that's why I say that you guys are heroes, no matter what anybody else says of any woman that stands by their man to that extreme, you know what I mean? It just holds down the fort and you guys are heroes, you know, so many blessings to you guys. And this is why I got you here to give you guys the floor to talk about what it is that you came to me to, um, to discuss. So, um, you guys chose to remain anonymous because of uh, retaliatory purposes. Um, so I'm going to refer to you guys as Mrs. A. Will Miss A please speak up? Uh, that that would be me. Hi. And then Mrs. B. <laughs> so hello, that's me. So what um what institution are your loved ones locked in currently? Is that, that a good answer seven, then? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Sentinella State Prison in Imperial, California. Okay. What what county is that? Because I'm from Florida, so I have no clue about that. Well, the county, I, I, they call it Imperial County as well, but it's also, I guess you could say the city would be El Centro, uh, but it is considered Imperial County. Got it. And what kind of facility is this? Is, is it a maximum security, a low security? It's a max. I, yeah, it would be a max. It's a level three, level four facility. Okay. And here again, because this is state, so I, I have no idea about how how that, that state system is over there. I know it's 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 messed up, but so level three, level four is, is level four the highest? Uh, level five is the highest. I want to say level level four and level three are mid uh mid max, I want to say medium maximum. Okay. So and this so this isn't the, the the roughest prison in the state or nothing like that. This is just your nor ordinary everyday state prison for the most yeah, part. Yeah, when you're talking about the 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 highest or the worst prisons in the state of California, that what comes to mind is Corcoran and Pelican Bay, and those are mm -hmm. the, the the serious prisons that are, you know, the worst of the worst. Got it. Okay, okay. Now, Mrs. A, please start. And, and just um, introduce my listeners as to what your experience is and what you have to share. Um, I mean, the most, the most important thing that we really want to bring to the forefront and the attention of some people is the fact that, you know, some of these staff members, um, they take their position and they, they abuse it. They, they, they what we that we call them frequently super cop in a sense where they abuse their power they abuse their authority they have blatant disregard for the families i mean sometimes i think that they forget that we're human you know what i mean they treat us as if we're the inmate at times and you know they talk down on on at us you know they don't talk to us they talk at us um they have no respect for the time and the money and you know, everything that we invest in our loved one being housed there and coming to visit them. And it's just, you know, sometimes it's like that saying goes where you get more bees with honey. You, you would just hope that they would come to work, do the job that they're paid to do and try to make life a little bit easier. I mean, it's bad enough they're behind these walls. A lot of these prisons in California are in the middle of nowhere in extreme heat. And, you know, they, they just have disregard for families' lives, you know, our time, as well as the inmates. I mean, I understand some of those men in there don't make their job easy, but the ones that do, it's like you purposely want to make their life hard when it's already hard enough as it is living there. So it, it, hmm. it's just time for, the, for light to be shed on the misconduct and the corruption and, you know, the blatant disregard for human life. And to expose the biggest gang in CDCR, which is the COs. Mm -hmm. Have you guys heard of the Green Wall? I didn't um, until investigating it after having a conversation with you. <laughs> right. So this is this is a notorious um, prison guard gang um, that that I interviewed uh, 
a a staff member of that particular prison where I guess the Green Wall was formed at, and he's been trying to to whistle blow on this Green Wall, you know, ever since. And and nobody's listening. Nobody cares. They're prisoners. They deserve whatever it is they get. So what if they get a couple little beatings, things of that nature? Um. I, everything that you you've described, you know, I've experienced, I've witnessed, you know, it's and and I actually just did a breakdown and of a particular instance where guards will come to us, especially if our women are attractive. Guards will come to us and tell us to our face that you guys were hitting on them in the in the parking lot after visitation. You know what I mean? And, and they'll say it with all seriousness. They'll just call us in the office. You know, they'll say, you know, hey, inmate, come here. You know, when I was leaving, you know, your old lady was was trying to hit at me and holler at me in the parking lot, you know. And it, and even though we look at them and, and we know it's bullshit, but it's always a seed that's planted. You know what I mean? And then right. the next time I call, yeah. I may have a little edge to my voice. You know, and then my girl may be like, you know, baby, what's wrong? And I, you know, nothing, you know, hey, did, did you approach anybody when you left visitation? You know, so it, it's already creating friction. It's just, they do, like you guys said, man, they do everything that they can possibly do to disrespect us, to break us down. And all it's doing, the result of what's happening is it's just creating more animosity between the community and our government, you know, system. And it's it's teaching our children again to to disobey the law and not respect the law because of what they see, how they treat you know our mothers, our fathers, and such. So, That's as so far true. as far as visitation, so right? Like um, now I think it was Mrs. A where she was stating you you knew somebody that had a particular instance with their loved one during visitation where the loved one came into visitation and I guess before visitation, they, they piss for breathalyzer or however they do it for alcohol and drugs. And then when they leave, they do the same thing. And so upon entry, he was clean and upon exit, he was dirty. But no, no trace of anything was found, right? Is that correct? That is correct. Oh. Okay. And, and how it was explained to you was the, the, the spouse, the visitor, was brought in or insinuated that she had brought this stuff in illegally, again, with no evidence of anything, right? Correct. And did they try to charge her? Or did they try to like harass her or get her to, I mean, what, so what was the, what was the result of that? Did she say? Um, they didn't suspend her or any are now trying to correct that wrong and point the finger at her husband stating that it was actually her husband who brought in the contraband who, cons who had the alcohol on him while they were in visit, in, in a family visit. Because the wife it, is ready to, um, she, she had did her report, she had reported them, and she's ready to fight the system in regards to defaming and um, implying that she did a criminal act. So the initial report, she has, she, has, she has documentation stating that she was first insinuated and then they tried to cover it up or, or reverse it and say that he was the one that brought it in. Yes, she has all the documentation. And so, again, and again, like, so like right I, now, go ahead. No, no, go, you please. No, I, I was just gonna just um, state that she's just now waiting on what actions to move forward um, because her. But 15 has not been heard yet. It's been going to go on two weeks now. She doesn't understand what the holdup is, what, why they're waiting so long to hear this. Um, because the, her husband has evidence on his side stating that, um, proving his case that, it, that he tested a false positive due to 
things that were left behind in the family visiting unit that was left for families to consume. The fact that the CEOs didn't follow policy, which is clean out the units before any other family is introduced into this unit. Since the families prior to them going in had leftover food, juices, whatever the case is, I mean, all those items in there, if the CEOs would have done their job and had removed all those items, they wouldn't be in the situation they are in now. Mm. And just so you're aware, in the state of California prison system, um, a 115 is a disciplinary write-up. Yes. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Sorry. Right. And, and it's a 100 series shot, which is the worst that you can get. Right. So, like, in, in the feds, it goes from 100 to 500, I believe, if I remember correctly. And, like, you know, 500s are kind of petty stuff. But when you get into 300s and then 200s and then 100s, you're subject to lose your visitation for months, your phone for months. You, you're, you can go to the shoe for months. You know what I mean? These are, these are harsh penalties yes. that you get for these 100s. Right. Wow. The, the yeah, they fear speaking up because, uh, like a wife I know, her husband spoke up and then, you know, they started messing with him with petty things, you know what I mean? Oh, saying they got a phone call from headquarters saying that there was a phone in his in his cell and, and they used that excuse to go in there and damage their personal property. The little things that give them a sense of home, photos of family members and, you know, the, the, the things that their food, you know, their TV. You know the fans, the thing, the little things that give them a little bit of comfort. They take that as an opportunity to go in and just destroy their pro their property. Right. Now, two quick stories I'm gonna share. One collaborating both of you guys' stories, and these are personal experiences of mine. So the first one, I had, and this was Miami FCI. I had a a female lieutenant who singled me out and put me in the shoe. Now, I've, I haven't had a shot in I don't know how long, years and years and years and years, you know, and this is a low, you know what I mean? So, and I'm getting ready to go home within like four or five months. So she singles me out, wow. out, of, out of a group of people and puts me in the shoe saying that I disrespected her and that I called her a name and all kinds of such. Now, being that I'm at the end of my bid, I already know that every day, Again, somebody had called out anxiety earlier. Every day, I have to uh, just monitor everything that I do and make sure that I'm always in the right place at the right time and that my, my tracks are covered because I know that officers will jam you up, you know? And if you're caught yes. somewhere where you're not supposed to be and this person is having a bad day, they'll tell you, well, you messed with me on the wrong day, partner, you know, and that's it. So- yep. I'm sitting in the shoe for three months now, and, and I done filed all the way to out, out of the prison. I done sent my grievances out of the prison. Now, as you said, what ended up happening was she went into her report later, hours later, went into the report and tried to change some of the, the, the facts of what she said earlier. And then, because she's a lieutenant, when it went to my DR hearing, this is how stupid these people are. When it went to my DR hearing, I'm sitting in there with the DR administrator, who of course is going to protect the lieutenant. And he says, he, he completely s tells me, like when he sentences me, it's completely the facts of that. It has nothing to do with what she said because there was no story. So he was trying to remember it. I guess another case that he was trying to fraudulently rope an inmate up and, and he brought that inmate's facts into my case that had nothing to do with what this woman was. It was the whole thing was just, it was a clusterfuck, you know? And then they ended up just coming to me and asking me, you know, they say inmate, they say, um, if you don't file this, we'll, we'll let you out. We'll, we'll throw it everything out and just as like if it never happened. Oh, and wow. I, and I told them then, I said, listen, I have six months left. I said, I won't say a word if you people leave me alone for these last six months. Just leave me alone. All I want to do is just work out and go home. So that was the deal, you know. 
Wow. And then as, as for the other one, now I'm a crocheter. I learned how to crochet inside. Right. And we used to be able to order our, our yarn off probably, you know, hobby craft or whatnot. And, and I spent four and a half months making the care bears for my daughter. I made all the care bears for my daughter and I was on the last one and I had them all in my locker. I had all my, my commissary and stuff in my Sally's locker. And then I had all these bears cause we had to keep all of our crap in these small ass lockers. Right. They come in and shake us down because they somebody left a, a knife in the ice machine or something like that. They shook the whole unit down. The cop comes in. Of course, these are cops. When they come in and shake down, these aren't cops that work the units. These are like special task force people, people from administration that never even come on the compound. They never have no interaction with the inmates. They just try to gather as many staff as they can from all over to come do these shakedowns. Man, this, this, this lady that worked up in the front office came in there and took all my Care Bears, told me that it was contraband. I wasn't allowed to have it, and she took it, right? Now, mind you, mind you, I am, because we're standing outside of the cell, and I got all of these lieutenants and whatnot, and I'm 38 hot, and I'm trying to tell the lady, lady, I have... My slip is right on the counter or, or, or in my locker. She's like, well, you should have had it on the counter. It was supposed to be on the counter. It wasn't. This is contraband. It's gone. They took it just like that. Just like that. All the hundreds of dollars that I spent on the yarn out of my own money that I worked for in, in, in Unicor, ordering yarn, all of this stuff to make this for my, it was for her Christmas. I was going to send it in a, because we can send Christmas boxes out, you know? And I never crocheted anything after that. I threw all my stuff away and I, and I was done with it, you know? So just like you guys say, these are experiences of mine. So I can back up what you say when it comes to that stuff. That's disheartening. They, they literally want to mentally break you down and then have you turn into this monster that they think you are, that you are when all they want to do is come home. That's all they want to do is come home. Just come home. And, and their models, you know, inmates, they, they, they're positive programmers. And Lord forbid, I, the anger in me is, it, I just want to have some alone time with these people. It's just not right. You know, how would they feel if this would happen to their family members? Would they feel the same way? Would they fight for their family? Would, would they agree with the mistreatment that they go through on a daily basis? It, it's, it's just mind boggling. And they wonder why, you know, a lot of these guys don't want to comply because it's hard. I, I can't, I can't. I, I can't imagine the, the stress level that our loved ones feel when they're in a situation where they're being targeted. It's just not right. It's not fair. These people need to be exposed. And I'm, I'm, and I'm speaking for a lot of the, the wives and the families that go through this on a daily mm -hmm. basis. Bless you, for that. you know, a lot of people don't understand that the shit is real. Fucked up shit happens every day behind those walls. And it's covered up from the top to the bottom. And it's fucking frustrating. It's mm -hmm. frustrating. The best advice you can give any inmate in them, in, in them instances is, is, you know, like how I looked at, at, at that stuff, you know, is at the end of the day, the only thing that's important is just coming home. One, alive. Two, without yes. a colostomy bag or holes in me or, or anything like yeah. that, or a rearranged face, broken bones, you know, anything. Yeah. I want to come in or come out the same way I went in. I mean, that's agenda number one. Everything after that is just me bidding. That's how I had to look at yes. it. I just could not be connected to any of it. If they took it, they took it. It doesn't matter. It's just, it, it's me just killing time. You know what I mean? In, in, in however fashion I was. You just have to disconnect from all of that. And know that in the front of your mind, this this is an agenda of theirs, right? 
What we have right. to understand, this is right. my message, you know, and, and either people buy my message or they don't. But I've been through this and I'm a I'm a very analytical person who pays attention. And, and them, them 13 years that I went through all of that, I paid attention, right, to what was going on and how this system was working. This is okay. an agenda for them. This is a business. It's a business. Yes. Right. And, and us standing outside with picket signs and all of that is, is like us standing in front of Amazon or Walmart or any of these other big companies and asking them to change their business model is not going to happen. It's a business. This is and why I of, asked. Some of these staff me, members are never going to change because they're protected. Some of them blatantly walk around and say, I'm untouchable. Yes, that's so true. So true that the union protects them. I heard that. I heard that at that particular prison, there's a, a, a specific lieutenant, I believe, that's a female or something that walks around telling inmates that she can just lock them up because her husband's a lieutenant or, or something along those lines. Have yes. you heard anything about she, that? Yes. She intentionally goes to work um, looking to write men up for frivolous things. Um, she tells the inmates that she dares you, I dare you to write me up. Nothing's going to happen to me because I belong to the union and my husband is a lieutenant and he's been a part of this union for 20 plus years. So nothing's going to happen to me. Do, what, do, do you guys by chance know this lieutenant's name? Ciota. Ciota, Lieutenant Ciota. She's not a lieutenant, she's just a CO, but her husband, well, her husband should be Ciota as well, but yes. Okay, so the husband's a lieutenant and she's a CO. Again, these are things that I've seen. Again, that like you guys, you guys are not saying anything that I haven't seen, I'm telling you. And this is in the federal system. You guys are in state and I'm on the other coast. Right. You know yeah, what I mean? That prison, I mean, there was a, a they have, <laughs> their disregard for human life, inmates and their families is so blatant that there was a child, regardless of his age, a child of an inmate had a seizure because of some mm -hmm. misconduct from a staff member who basically blatantly said, the warden has no say so over how he conducts processing. Like, yeah. how much more <laughs> proof do you need of their disregard for human life when you can watch a child have a seizure that was caused by your actions? And then not even show no regard towards that. No remorse for it. Correct. Your response but blame to this, the this mother. Family. Yes, your response to this mother was, well, pick an appointment time when it's not so hot. Hmm. First of all, we're going through global warming. <laughs> That's number one. Number two, majority of these California institutions are in the middle of nowhere. In the areas where it's the hottest, Centinella in particular, it gets up to 120 degrees. So when yes. is there any relief? And the state prisons don't have AC, right? Do they have they AC They have it in no? the areas where their staff is. So they're comfortable. So in the processing area, they have it there. Mm. Uh, they sometimes have it blowing in the visiting rooms, um, but there's fans in there that aren't always on. But the fact mm. that we families have to wait outside in this heat. Sorry. It's okay. Have I can edit all that out, so it's okay. Okay. Have to wait outside in this heat with our children and elderly are also waiting outside in this heat for them to not allow children, the elderly in the air conditioned processing center to await their processing time is, is mind boggling. They're, they're literally going against the policy and as human life as well, they, they just don't care. They mm -hmm. just don't care. Well, no, I mean that's it. They don't care. They're 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 underpaid, you know. Okay. They're 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 underpaid. Ninety percent of these people couldn't be cops 
or military, you know what I mean? And and they fall into right. into security. Some are military, come back from from wartime. You know what I mean? And and because they can't get a job anywhere else, they probably couldn't pass no psychology test to become a cop or whatever. So they fall into security. You know what I mean? And you have these military minded because again, listen, America, this is what I'm saying. It's the same training. This is this again. This is what I'm trying to get people to understand. The way that they train CO guards is the same. It's the same federal training. It's all the same training. So what these ladies and I tell you about how things are applied in prison is how they're applying them to our communities in the same fashion. It's the same fashion. Yes. It's the same fashion. It's the same mentality. It's the same training. It's coming from the same source. You know, and I believe that they use our prisons as, as, as some sort of like, some sort of like scientific experiment. You know what I mean? All of this, all of this entrapment and, and confinement and how it, how it affects people. Like we're test labs in there, you know, I they agree. sent, they sent all of this, this fake medication in there to test on us to see how we would react you know, I mean, I've seen people have seizures in their cell, heart attacks in their cell, and, you know, bang, you could bang on the door all night and nobody would ever come. And you got to lay in your cell all night with this, this person, you know, and then you got to worry about it. And that's not even the anxiety. The anxiety is them coming and charging you for killing him. You know what I mean? It's oh, just... yes. Yes. Under their care. Under their... That's what they're going to do. Ugh. That's. It's not, it's not that you're tripping out that you're in the cell with a dead person. It's that you know that medical fucked this person up and killed this person, and they're going to blame that shit on you, you know? And you may have, like, two years yeah. left to do in your bid. They do right. this. And that's like that particular CEO that told this, this mother that um, Lieutenant Tovar, you know, he's blatantly telling a mother to pick a different time to, for her son to come see his father. And basically making it as it's if it's her fault. When our warden has stated multiple times he has no issue with, you know, children and elderly and disabled waiting in the air conditioning until it's their time to be processed and to visit. You know, and him blatantly stating, well, the warden doesn't have jurisdiction over visiting. How is that the case when he's the warden of the institution? You know, for you to have a, a person in that position of power that can just show disregard for the person who's his boss, you know, the chain of command in a sense, how can you allow that person to stay in that position? Clearly, there needs to be some rearranging in your, you know, your staff. Or, or and, and like yeah. I say, and like I say, and, and, and again, I, I need, I need people, man. I need people because... I'm on, I'm on some other type of time, for real, for real. Like, if you're not showing me change, then I'm going to just label you the same thing that you label me, and that's a terrorist. Because when I go in and I look at the definition of what a terrorist is, right, you fit that. But because you're telling me who the terrorists are, I'm supposed to believe that because you say it. But when I go and look at the definition of what terrorism is and what a terrorist is, that fits almost 90% of our Senate and, and our House. Amen to that. Uh, yep. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's listen, man, like, and, and I say this again on my show, I do not negotiate with terrorists. I'm not going and wanting to talk to no senators, no governors, the president. I don't want to talk to none of them people. And I want to get to a point to where they have to come to me now. You see what I'm saying? And then I'm going to sit back and decipher who the terrorist is and who isn't. Because if you haven't done anything that you were supposed to be up there to represent, as far as it comes to, you know, um, incarceration rates, recidivism, any of that, you know, then I don't know what to tell you because this is, this is destroying our communities. So if you're not my friend, you're my enemy, plain and simple. Amen to that. Amen to that. So listen, this is, uh, okay, go ahead. No, I just wanted to go back to the wife that is, that was implicated in bringing in the contraband. The same lieutenant, um, so Tovar, 
prior to this incident, she had sent an email pretty much um, exposing his conduct and pretty much addressing the issue of that child having a seizure. Um, she feels because of that email, she is now being retaliated against due to her, um, to that email that was sent to the warden. So there was an email that was sent to the warden about her behavior as it pertained to the see the kid with the seizure. Yes, the the warden sent an this was email a, to the. This was the Go same. This, this was the same chick that was walking around in the compound talking about locking people up or whatever. No, no, no. This is no. I'm talking about the wife. The wife okay. who uh, was defamed by a CEO. Stating oh. that um, her husband tested a false positive, and they okay. implicated her as the one who brought in the contraband. Got she it. states that um, due to that email that was sent, she she wants to be. She states that that is possibly um, it's connected because the retaliation, because that is the same CEO that wrote a a, a chrono conflicting. The original write-up, if you know what I mean. Like, got it. No, I'm, so I'm with you. So, so far, yeah, okay, yeah. So, because of her actions, she feels that it is a retaliation play from this lieutenant. Because what this wife did was she wrote an email to the warden advocating for the child that had the seizure. Um, because of Lieutenant Tovar and his actions in the, in the processing center. So when she wrote that email advocating for the, the child who had the seizure and implicating Lieutenant Tovar's conduct, that's when Lieutenant Tovar then, uh, in a sense, started coming for that wife, making her a target. Okay, got it, got it. So listen, I'm going to add because the time is almost up. So I'm going to end and send you guys another link. And then, um, and then I'm going to get into that because that's, that's a good entryway into, into bringing that in like that. So I can break that down. And, okay. and then what I want okay. to do is, cause I don't know how busy you guys are, how much more oh, free no, time you have. <laughs> well, then we, we can write we so, Because what I want to do is, 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 is get away from, um, I want to get more into what we need to do as a community, how, okay. like we, we hear you. You know what I mean? But what, what can we do sort of right. thing, ex especially in that area or whatnot? So I'm going to cut here and then send y'all new one. Yes. And you mentioned something about the, the wife in that instant. What was that again? So there was a wife who sent an email to the warden, um, basically advocating for the child who had a seizure in visiting because of the lieutenant and his misconduct and him not following a simple procedure that the, the warden set up to help with those types of instances. Got um, it. The so, wife sent an email advocating, and then Lieutenant Tovar, of course, you know, these COs feel like, how dare you snitch on me? How dare you tell on me? And but who is she? Like, why do they care? Who is Lieutenant Tovar? No, no, I'm saying who is who is the lady that's advocating? Like, why do they care that she's advocating? Right. It's 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 just the fact that we as families, I mean, it's bad enough, you know, we're we're treated less than. So of course, us families try to stick together in a sense. So we band together, and that wife thought she was helping. You know, Let, let's bring this to the attention of the warden. Like, you know, that's not okay for this child. You know, what if something worse would have happened? You know, in result of the seizure. But does and, she have some sort of pull or some sort of power that that she felt that her advocacy might have might have um you know uh, felt heard? Well, every California you cut out um, you you cut out for like the last five seconds. Okay, so every California prison has what's something what's called an uh, inmate family council. So what this council does is they try to keep the line of communication open between the families and the prison, you know, try to make sure that the prison knows what's going on with families to try to better help assist them and make their jobs easier, you know, as um, 
from what I've seen as far as, you know, the council go, I feel like, you know, it's just an open line of communication. So that way facilities have that, you know, that, that communication basically. And I believe that wife was part of that council, if I'm not mistaken, I'm not, you know, and she sent that email to the facility in hopes that it would possibly help because that's what inmate family councils are for and it backfired, you know what I mean? And it's, it's disheartening because it's like you get, um, they get on these councils to try to help and then when you try to help now you're being punished in a sense you know what I mean so it, it, well as, as far as the retaliation against so the husband was was receiving retaliation now did this did this retaliation start just miraculously after the the alcohol incident or was he always being just singled out He wasn't being singled out. Um, it, it, it happened after the alcohol incident. And what kind of retaliatory measures are they taking against him? The, that frivolous write-up, and I want to say, implying that his wife brought in the contraband. Got it. Okay, so all of this is the result of that. Okay. Yes, and then all she, of that and, is and then she sent in an email to the warden advocating for the parent of the seizured child. And then more retaliation occurred from there as well. Well, all of this pr happened prior to the write-up that she her husband received. All of the email that she sent to the oh. warden happened prior to. Oh, 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 okay. So the timeline for me was backwards. So she advocated first and then, yes. and then they have this family, this family visit. And now all of a sudden somebody's bringing alcohol into the visit and they want to punish the whole family essentially. Correct. Got it. How far was like that timeline in between? Do you know? Approximately maybe. Maybe a month after. So very short, a month after. Okay. So. And the wife also sent an email complaining on another CO, and his name is Carlos, in implementing or well, um, pretty much calling him out on his lack of his job. And that particular CO was the originator of the 115, the RVR, the, um, the disciplinary, indicating in this 115 that his visitor, which is the wife, had to be the one that brought in the alcohol. But there's so no evidence prior, of nothing, though, right? Just <laughs> right, none. Just a false positive. It's all accusation. On, yes, exactly. And then Officer Carlos, just to be clear, he's the um, our family visiting coordinator at that institution. He basically oversees um, if you get an appointment to have an overnight stay with your loved one. Um, and he's not innocent as well. I mean, there's misconduct on his end. If you send a complaint on him, uh, miraculously, your application for family visitation is misplaced. Um, recently, a wife, um, mm -hmm. she had a family visit in July and um, she sent in her husband, of course our husbands, they want those visits right away if they can. So hmm. once you get back from a family visit, you submit a new application. The way that works is you, you fill it out, you send it to the coordinator through the mail. So her husband sent in this application in July after they left their family visit, which was actually July 7th. So people are now getting new dates. You know, you it's normally every 90 days. And so she sent in, her husband sent in the new application. And then when she sent, when he sent in that new application, she inquired today because everybody's getting new dates but them. So she inquired with the prison, you know, what's going on with our date? They're like, oh, we, we didn't get your application until August. She said, well, my husband sent it July 9th. This is when he mailed it out. The application should have a date on it, right? 
So the the sergeant in our at our institution, and her name is Sergeant Santana, she told the wife, well, we didn't receive your application in July. So she asked her, well, when my husband sent in that application, he dated it, right? And she said, well, yeah, but we didn't receive it in July. Okay, so where did it sit for an entire month? We're coming in up on the end of September. Where was this application for an entire month? You know what I mean? It's, it's little things like that, that it's like, what is your mm -hmm. goal? Is your goal to discourage us not to want these visits or to, to discourage us not to be with our loved one? What is, what is, what is your end goal? Here. Well, I can, I can personally tell you that one of the goals is they hate visitation. The institutions hate visitations. They sit there, uh, 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 you know, they, they like to claim, oh, we like visits because it keeps the inmates calm and, you know, it keeps them passive and we want to build family community. It's all PC bullshit. These people will ship you across the state, across the country. They don't care about your family. You know what I mean? The, the families they do care about are the rats the pedophiles, you know, things of that nature. They try to keep them home. They feel bad for them people. But for us, as far as just your common folk, man, we're shipped all over. They don't care about your family. You know, they don't care. They don't care. They try to discourage visitation. Anytime any little skirmish or anything happens on the yard, you know, they, they pull visitation. They'll shut visitation down for months. You know, they don't care. They don't care. So we know all of these things, right? What can the people do? The people that are listening to this here, what, what, can, what can we do? Because as you mentioned earlier, each, and, and this is something that's new to me, but each state prison in California has a family council, sort of a union, if you will, where loved ones can come together and congregate and, and talk about issues that are going on inside of the prison. And the prison is supposed to listen to that and, and maybe adhere to some of these changes. But is that really happening or is this just more PC crap? I mean, they, there are instances where they do take the, the suggestions of the, that council and they implement those changes. We personally can attest to some of those things, but it's not always, of course, no. But what we need more families to do is we need them to Everybody's scared of retaliation. We all are. We all know that, you know, once you complain on someone, okay, now they feel like, how dare you do this? And we're going to try to find a way to get you. We can never stop that. But if there's strength in numbers, yes. make your voice heard. Amen. If you're going to tuck your tail and run every time they do something, then they're just going to continue to do the shit. Make your voice heard. Complain. There's internal affairs. There's the CDCR secretary. There's the ombudsman. You have to start somewhere because all they see is we just going to keep getting away with it. They too scared to do anything. Why can't we start something like a class action suit? You feel me? There, you know what? There was one that started at another institution and it surrounded it by COVID. I believe, um, I don't want to misspeak. I want to say it was San Quentin. Um, mm -hmm. There, you know, OSHA came through that facility and they saw the lack there of protection from COVID and mm -hmm. they were hit with an enormous lawsuit. You know what I mean? But it I'm had not talking start. about a, a, a lawsuit per se, but what I'm thinking of is, is like a class action suit. But what we'll do or what we can do is just start putting the word out about on a certain day, just one day, all of these family members come together and file all at the same time mm -hmm. on their grievances. So they get hit with a hundred, two hundred, three hundred grievances all on the same day, all at the same time. It has to start with these families not being scared. <laughs> but that's what a, I'm saying is every it's, one family that's not scared, there's a hundred scared. There's a hundred scared. And it's like what and the men, even the men are they're like they're telling their families, don't do it. They're going to get, they're going to come for us. Don't do it. They're going to toss our cell. Don't do it. They're going to send us to the hole. They're going to find something to send us to the hole for. But see, you know, they have to do their part too, though. You know, these dudes have to do their part too. And, and, and I hear what they say, but 
there's 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 bigger things going on than hiding you know contraband and you like they have to tighten their shit up too and know that there's gonna be heat that's gonna come on them too so you and and it's and again i'm trying to reach these people inside as well and stop fighting with each other inside and stop segregating each other inside and again come together like all the all the unit speakers need to come together and say listen man for for right now we're putting all this shit up we're getting rid of all contraband and we're gonna go full-fledged on all this all this corruption these they can come in here and search our shit they can take our visitation they can take our phones they can do all that but we're going full-fledged on this shit this is what we're gonna have to do i agree this is the only like you said it's this is gonna take a national effort it's gonna take and it, because this is in every county, any county that has a prison in it, this is what's going on. Because one, right. that prison that prison feeds the county. Like you said, these prisons are out in the, in the middle of nowhere. You know why? Because they can stick a prison in the middle of nowhere and employ 4,000 people in that small little town. And that right. town like is going to... This particular prison is near the Tijuana-Mexico border. Mm-hmm. So you probably do have those COs that are coming across to work. And it's in an agricultural county. So that's where they're doing all the growing of the vegetables and the, you know, the hay and everything. It's literally nowhere. We have to come up with something, you know, again, and this is where, this is where it takes place. Again, I'm here. This is my platform. If you guys know people that want to come on like you, anonymous and just share their story i'm here but it has to happen you know this is i'm here I, I built this channel for you guys this is this is for you guys it's not for me it's not like subscribes i don't care about none of that crap i'm trying to expose what's going on and i built this for you guys to come and share what you guys are going through because we ain't lying about shit like I said, man, you heard what these ladies said. They're in California. I don't, I do not know these ladies, right? Like one of the ladies reached out to me on Twitter. You know what I mean? So, and her story is the same exact story that I shared and a whole different, the, the state is completely different from federal. It's completely different, right? The whole different regime, but it's still under the same umbrella. And what you hear these ladies saying is, was my experience with my own eyes in a federal system across the country. So, I mean, that, what does that tell you? You know, and, and what I want, what I want my, my, we the people to understand, I know you may be sitting there like, man, who really gives a shit? They're prisoners, this and that. Nobody gives a shit until it comes to your door. Again, this is a business. And eventually they're gonna, they're gonna need more clients. They write more laws, they lock up more people, they get more people into the system. Eventually it's gonna hit your door. But at the bottom line, it's tearing our communities down. It's tearing our communities down. From point A to point B, you're, you're separating the house, right? You're separating the parent from the children, you're separating the house, you're sending that person into an institution that is going to teach them how to be even more criminal, have more trauma, yes teach them how to be more violent right and then you're sending yep. them home with no kind of no kind of re-entry process whatsoever you have no counselors or psychologists in the halfway houses you know when these guys are coming home to transition with and then and then you're sending them off into the communities and then you're turning around and putting so much pressure on them that they can't even sustain it and then you wonder why the recidivism is 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 70 something percent because it's a business, man. They know what they're doing. And so yeah. many people say, Oh, I would never be with an inmate. I would never do this. I would never do that until the shoe is on the other foot. Let you be with someone who was not never incarcerated and they do something stupid, drinking and driving, any any type of criminal action, and they end up in the position. So now, because you were married to this person when they were on the street and they end up in a situation where they're incarcerated, so now you're leaving. It's just that easy to tuck and walk away. No, you never know what you're going to do until you're put in that position to do it. Amen. That's right. You're, you don't know. And Sentinel Estate Prison needs to be exposed. They need I, know, to be. I know many women that have been beat by their husbands. I know many women that have been raped by people that have never been incarcerated, never even had a charge before. You know, 
I've, I know people that have been frauded by people that have never been in prison or charged before. You know, so just because a person is in prison doesn't mean that they're going to do anything that you're not susceptible to out here in, in real life. It's just, again, it's stigma put on us to keep us down and to keep the business rolling. And that's just all it is. And until we wake up to that, it doesn't Amen, matter. Because our criminal justice system is very flawed. We live in a, in a society where it's not innocent until proven guilty. You're guilty until you prove your innocence. Because nine times out of 10, when you walk into that courtroom, they already believe that you're guilty. They want you to show us and prove to us that you're innocent. Prove your innocence. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. That's exactly right. And, and, and what we have to do as a community, again, you may be asking when you go to vote, if you notice on the ballot, one of the least uh, conspicuous people on that ballot is the prosecutor. Nobody knows who these prosecutors are that are on this ballot, but yet those are the most powerful people in the land. They're more powerful than the judges. The judges bow down to, to the prosecutor. The prosecutor can do whatever they want in the court system. This is, again, where we start. Know who these prosecutors are. Know their body of work. Don't listen to them. They could tell you anything. You know what I mean? Air, air makes sound when it goes through the lips. But if your body of work is not behind that, then it means nothing. Kamala Harris sits up here and runs her mouth about all the good things that she does. But her body of work don't show that. Y'all are from California. You know that. Amen. The per the one person that we have in office that's for criminal justice reform and the other person and our other the DA that we have that's in office right now that's for criminal justice reform. Everybody wanted him out of office. They they pushed this recall election for Gavin Newsom, and by the grace of God, it did not work because he's the only governor besides Jerry Brown when he left that was for criminal justice reform that doesn't want to see people just locked up and thrown thrown away. And but is he for involved. them? Is he for them? Is he is he doing something? Is he getting laws? Is he pressing these people to get this changed? He's definitely he's definitely active and pressing for change. There's a lot of bills that passed since he's been in office that that will help that will help a lot of people that were given these indeterminate sentences that, that never had hope of coming home that now have that hope. You know what I mean? He grants these clemencies. He grants these commutations to the, these inmates that are filing for these, these commutations. He he his work. Mm -hmm. And people don't like that. They, they don't want to see change. They want to continue to see mass incarceration. Well, sure. It's always been that agenda. Always, if, if, if you remember, I mean, I don't know how, how old you ladies are, but going back presidencies, right, it's the presidency that always won the seat was the one that always talked about tougher laws, more police, more laws, stricter, because, again, it's the agenda. Right, the stigmas put out there through your local TV's channels and, and your news and your locked up series and, and all of this crap that they put out there against inmates to, to keep the people scared. So now when these politicians are up there preaching about, you know, tougher laws, everybody's, yeah, 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 you know, lock these people up. These people are nuts. Again, it's all stigma. It's all part of the plan. It's all part of the business, man. So it's we the people. We have to make change. You see, these ladies are doing what they can do, but it takes it takes everybody, man. It just can't be them too. We can't have just ten people outside of a building. You know what I mean? Like, come on, people, put down the football, put down the drugs, put down the alcohol. Start getting a hold of your local community leaders. Start just volunteering at your local school. You know what I mean? Schools can use your help. Detention centers, like like, get involved with the children so we can change this, get our kids to understand that when you go out and you commit these crimes, you're feeding agenda. They want you to go out and commit these crimes. They want you to go riot. They want you to go loot. They want you to burn down your buildings. They want you to kill your neighbor. This is what they want you to do so they can continue to oppress us. Man, please stop. So do like these ladies are doing, man. These are some heroes right here, some real community heroes. And um, and we have to do something. Either either we'll come with a link. We're gonna come up with something for real. We're gonna come up with something where we can start gathering names and start getting a group. Because when we start getting numbers, more will come. I promise you. I promise you that. So, 
Um, thank you, ladies, for really, really coming and sharing this. And I'll give you guys the floor to, to say anything you want to say. Plugs, if you guys know any businesses, anything you want to plug, anything that you guys want us to say. I personally want to, um, there's a few advocacy groups, uh, Fuel Families United to End Life Without the Possibility of Parole. Um, that's one that's very great that they have numbers. You know, they, they're pushing to end, you know, LWAP as what we call it in California. Um, so that's, that's very, that's one justice group that's fighting for, you know, for the long sentences. Um, and I just want families to understand that until we make our voices heard, nothing will change. Nothing will change. So please band together with us. Don't just sit back and just let the, the things keep happening. We have to, if we don't do it, nobody else will. So we have to start somewhere. I agree. I, I just want to give a, um, to say thank you to you for allowing us to speak on your platform, getting the word out there. And hopefully this message does get out to families to encourage them to come forth because um, there are we, there is power, power in numbers. And hopefully one day we do see a change within the CDCR system and it will be because of families who aren't afraid to speak up, who, who are ready to take on the, the beast and not back down from it because they need to be exposed and they need to stop. Amen, ladies. Well, again, thank you. Um, and just reach out to me. And if, like I say, if you guys know anybody else that wants to come on anonymous as you guys have and just share their story, please send them to me. Um, if you guys know also, um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with my foundation, but I deal with incarcerated families, uh, guys and, and women that are coming home. The families don't know how to deal with these individuals or, or some of the triggers or anything like that. Um, I can step in as a life coach in that situation. Also, if, you know, if, uh, people are going to prison and, you know, ladies like yourself don't know how to adjust, don't know how to, because the man was the provider, you know, I can help in those instances okay. as well. Um, and just mentorship. If you know anybody in prison that could just, could just use mentorship from somebody that truly understands what they've been through, you know, I, I can, I can do that too. So. Um, it's a win-win for everybody in these situations, but like, like you heard the lady say, man, we, we just have to get up and do it, man, because if not, it's, it, it's, it's just gonna, it's gonna tear our, our communities down to the point to where they're gonna create laws to keep us locked down, and before you know it, it's just gonna be a, a socialistic environment, and they're gonna just tell us to stay in our house, Amazon will deliver everything to us, and if we're caught outside of our house, we're gonna go to prison. That's what it's coming to, man. Yeah, I feel it. So, ladies, thank you. Go take care of your families, man, and get some, some much-needed rest, okay? Thank you. We appreciate you. No yes, we do. Thank you. I appreciate you guys, for real. All right. Have a good night. God bless. God bless.